uh, I want to uh, talk to a senior executive. Uh, and I wrote this piece on you guys. I think you want to see this. It's a pretty popular blog, blah, 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 right? He goes, oh, I'm sorry. We have no way of looking at your piece. I said, what, you don't have internet connectivity, <laughs> right? He said, we and he, he wouldn't actually explain why, but he said, I have no way of doing it. So I said, and I, I swear what I'm about to say is true next. I said, well, uh, how about if I email you something? We have no inbound customer email. Now, this is the troubleshooting team that reports to the president of DirecTV. So then I ended, you know what I ended up doing? I printed it out and faxed it. He had a fax, right? So I faxed it to him. And you know what he did? And we're going to get into this a little later, too, on another case where I'm going to show you a tactical success that led to a massive strategic failure. Uh, he actually sent it straight off to PR. PR, not customer service, PR. I mean, I'm flattered, but at the same time, bad mistake. So I, I said, I want to have a conversation with a senior customer service executive. And he said, I'll put in your request. I said, maybe you don't understand. This isn't a request. Right? So I, he said, I'll put in your request. They said, OK. So uh, I went and I found a widget. And that all it did was count up from zero seconds, minutes, hours, days. And I put it on top of my blog. And then I'm going to have to teach you a little Yiddish here, OK? There's a, a Yiddish term for crap, which is drek, D-R-E-C-K. So on top, I said, uh, amount of time since I demanded conversation with senior drek TV executive. And I kept calling him drek TV from then on. Right? So <laughs> then what happened was about three weeks later, to be exact, thanks to the counter, 23 days later, um, I get on a Sunday an email, we need to talk, Ellen Filippiak, Senior Vice President, Customer Care, DirecTV. Ended up talking to her. The net, net of that was almost every, every other month for almost two years, she wrote a post on my blog on how they were fixing their customer issues. And she did such a good job that I chaired the CRM Evolution Conference, which is a CRM Magazine's conference in New York every year. And we brought her last year as a speaker on that. And we've become actually good friends since then. And they've solved a lot of the issues. Now, the interesting thing is, this never went viral, ever. It was just me putting up basically a widget and calling them crap, really. But the reality was, the fear of that is what did this. It was the fear of it. It doesn't have to go viral. It's the fear of what might happen because of how trust has transformed and because of the rapidity and amplification with new channels that exist out there. That's what we're talking about. And that's the power of all of this. And that's the power of a social customer and what a business has to take care of. Now, here's the other thing of note before we move on to the next part of this when it comes to the social customer. Both Nielsen in 2009 with Global Faces on Network Places and Morgan Stanley came out with studies that said for the first time in history, more people are communicating via social networks than email. Now, that said, I can probably find you 15 studies that say the exact opposite thing, that say more people are still communicating on email than social networks. You know what the incredible part of this is? The very fact that those two studies exist indicate a sea change. Not whether they're right. The very fact whether, again, I can overwhelm you with the other end, too. It doesn't matter. That's statistics. You can pretty much prove what you want. Right? All the studies I ever show you and I will show you, I can probably find the opposite. So the reality is that the fact that they exist indicates a massive change in ways we communicate. And that's amazing. Because now people are transforming to one-to-many, many-to-many, and still one-to-one -one continues. Now here, I'm sure some of you have seen this. This is Brian Solis's conversation prism. And each of these little flower petals represents a, a channel category, not a channel. This is a category of channels, video blogs, regular blogs. Uh, social networks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And each of the logos in there, of course, is a channel within the category. And those are only examples. And that's overwhelming. I mean, you're talking about hundreds right there. 
And there really are thousands of channels, and people are communicating. And what we'd like to say, when people always say, I get a lot of this from especially enterprise level clients, what you hear is, well, how do we deal with all that? There's so many people out there and they're talking badly about us and we need to, we don't know how to deal with all those channels. And we'd all love to say, really, you know, given where we are, well, you know, listening, social media, the reality is, don't do anything to make them talk badly about you. That's actually what you should be doing. You should be taking care of it here. Remember what Mitch Joel said yesterday, don't suck. He's right. That actually is absolutely right. Then, in fact, really, if they're out there and you're not hearing them, and, but they're saying good things, great. Now, it's better to find out what they're saying, good and bad, of course. But the reality is it still starts from how you treat the customer from the business, not the channels and how you're dealing with the channels per se. You have to deal with them. But it's still based on your corporate culture and your policies and your processes and your activities and what you do with those customers. Now, the problem is you have this massive disconnect, too, between the corporations and the uh, customer. So here's something that came out. IBM did this study, uh, and this is a very good group at IBM. By the way, they're, they're generally their um, their um, reports are very good. The IBM Institute for Business Value. I mean, you know, as always, it's IBM. So it's going to be a little self-serving, but at the same time, you have this report that just came out about three weeks ago called "From Social Media to Social CRM." And the data is good. The ideas are in it are, eh. Uh, but look at this. So the idea is, on this side, this is why businesses think consumers follow them on social sites. On this side is the consumers talking about why they interact with companies. So I want you to take a look at the businesses' rankings here. They think the least important reason is buying stuff and getting discounts. What do consumers say is the most important reason? Buying stuff and getting discounts. Why do they think Groupon is doing as well as it is, right? I mean, you're seeing things like that because, in fact, that's still important. And what did the Edelman Trust Barometer say for 2011? High quality products and services are what needs to be given. Okay, so that has never changed. People are not that interested in loving your company. They're interested in getting stuff from your company. And hopefully, they can do more than that if your company shows them something. They'd like you to be a company like them, so to speak. But if you're not, you're not. They're not going to cry. right? So you want advocates, and we'll get into that too. But right now, the best thing you can do is at least keep the ordinary, meaning the processes and the products and services that you're providing, Keep them ordinary, meaning meet the expectations of those customers. Then all the conversations going on out on the social web and out on traditional channels will be at least neutral and probably positive because you're doing what the customers are asking of you. So let's look at social CRM itself. Here's the definition I gave it. It's a short version. This is the short version. I think it's still tweetable. I might have taken it out of that. But Social CRM is the company's programmatic response to the customer's control of the conversation. The irony is when that one went up, it created this like outburst of insane discussion of, among lunatics, basically, in the industry. So, and you know what the argument was over? The word control. Everyone thought that that, in effect, I read interpretations which, in effect, said, well, this is basically a fascist takeover of business by customers. I mean, it's like at that level of insanity. All this means is very simple. Right now, the customer can impact your business without you even knowing it, number one. And number two is they can do it in channels that you don't control. That's it. It's not that complicated. And then your job as a company is to figure out a program to respond to it, which utilizes those channels if it makes sense, and, and provides value to the customer who, in return, provide value to you. Simple. Not very complicated. So the practical way to start looking at social CRM right now, because it's not really being holistically carried out in any place but one, which we'll go into in a, in a bit, is to think of it as sort of an umbrella term for all these evolving practices that are going on. And I mean, there's a number of them we're talking about there. So and we'll get into them in a bit. This is a valid industry. 
I mean, right now we're talking, you can see in a, in a fit of narcissism, I put my book as the first reason for validation, right? <laughs> right? But the second reason is the altimeter group, and this is when Ray Wong was still with them, um, built 18 use cases, and now there's over 100. Gartner, who tends to validate pretty much everything just by producing things like this, Gartner's magic quadrant in June uh, 2010 was the first social CRM magic quadrant. They're predicting a 20, in 2012 a billion dollar sub-industry. CRM is still 13 to 16 billion. Social software, this market, uh, in the purest sense, is 770. That's the, their forecast for this year. The reason that the disparity, by the way, is CRM is a mature market. Social, social software is not yet. And so a lot of this is pilots that you're seeing, a lot of money for pilots. Radiant 6, actually, the Radiant 6 acquisition by Salesforce is, is a great move and also starts helping to validate the industry on the larger scale, too. Now, these are the tactics we're actually seeing when it comes to social CRM now. They're tactics. So you'll see what you know already. A, a customer care social uh, or, or a customer care Twitter channel or um, just a share button inside of email marketing or, um, or using user-generated content to actually drive a marketing initiative. A perfect example, I, I don't want to go through the details because I won't have the time, but anyone who wants to hear it, just come and I'll tell you the story afterwards. It's on the Queensland, in Australia, in other words, the Queensland Tourism Bureau, and how they used the, the amazing story, great story too, really cool. I will just tell you one thing. The idea was to, a six-month gig as chief uh, caretaker of the Great Barrier Reef for $100,000 for the six months in the middle of the recession. Now, here's the thing. The winner, this guy bends something, within the space of two weeks got bitten by a fish, right? So, but the story how he got there is phenomenal. But that's another one. In the sales side, we're starting to see the, the use of sales intelligence, where they're taking all that unstructured information out there, using tools like Radiant 6, um, and they're beginning to actually focus it on contacts and accounts and then driving in structured and unstructured data so that salespeople have a capability to actually expand their knowledge of a company and individuals of that company to increase their chances to successfully close the sale. So we're starting to see all of that happening. And from a technology standpoint, it's the integration of social software with CRM software. We're seeing that everywhere. What we're really dealing with here, though, is not managing customers anymore. We're dealing with engaging them. They have to be involved in your business, and that's the point. The idea is that, from a fundamental standpoint, you all have customers. They all have something to tell you. Remember what Marcel just did? He wants your feedback? That's exactly what I'm talking about. That sounds simple. It's a conversation he had, right? He simply said, give us your feedback, please. He's not kidding. He wants it. They're going to listen to it. They're going to act on it. What did he do? He responded to you from the standpoint of what? You want to know about the Salesforce thing? We'll tell you. I mean, think about what's going on in that. That sounds normal, conversational, but in fact, it's invaluable for him to hear what you've got to say, and he trusts it. He trusts it. And that's what we're talking about by customer engagement. You do that with your customers, you'll see a massive uptick in the kind of people who are going to advocate for you, not just be loyal, who are going to go out and advocate for you. Because they trust you as a company with, an effect, a human face that they can identify with. That's the kind of stuff we mean when we're talking about engagement. I'm not going to get into this right now. I'll get into this some other time. I'll skip by it. I'm going to go through some trends right now a little bit, too, on what's moving forward now as we're sitting here. Because, in fact, these trends are critical to understanding where the world that we all live in is going to go. Now, one of the things to recognize is 